And then I think I'll, I'll start from here. Um, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, thank you uh, for being here. We hope uh, everyone is uh, healthy and uh, will stay that way for this uh, crazy and unconventional times, to say the least. Um, make sure your maybe your microphone is on mute i think i think it sounds like it is at least um i hope the sound quality is good and you can uh, hear us well this is a time to make small adjustments before uh, we start and through this event uh feel free to write your questions uh there's a there is a q a um interface there where you can you know write your questions and um we'll we'll do our best to go through all of them uh we will try to have two q a session uh q a one which will be in about half hour when we see the first setup on uh, converging optics and then a final q a uh, at the end and um we'll also conduct a small uh poll also at the end, which you know, it would be very nice if, if anyone, everyone could uh, participate in the poll. Uh, the organizers of this uh, webinar are uh, Guillaume Dovillet, uh, Chief Technical Officer of Imagine Optic, based in Orsay, France. Uh, at, at one point, Guillaume will take over and we'll see him live uh, in the lab or more like a conference room in, in France. Jerome Belesta and myself, uh, Philippe Clemenceau, we are both uh, based in the US. You probably, some of you know us already, I'm sure. Uh, Jerome is based uh, in Sacramento. I am based uh, in Boston. And we're here to show you a live demonstration of our new RFLEX2 system for optical characterization. This is a first webinar of, out of a series of three. Uh, the next one will be on wavefront measurement and adaptive optics in a few weeks. And in this demo, we will show you two examples of setups. Uh, the first setup will look at a, a camera lens. Uh, and the second setup would be on a, um, on a zero power component uh, with a collimated beam. Okay. But please, uh, even though we're showing this simple uh, characterization. Keep in mind that the system can be used for many a different, many other uh, uh, optical systems to be characterized, which could be much more complex. Uh, so here in this slide, actually, I'm showing, you know, very sim you know, simple components, dichroics, uh, wave plates, uh, lenses, uh, mirrors. But of course, it could be a combination of lenses, like an objective. It could be a VR system. It could be a large telescope. It could be even an, a full optical bench setup that you have in your lab, passing through all the lenses and characterizing the, um, the wavefront and so on. This is uh, how we'll spend our time for the next hour. Hopefully we won't spend too much time on the slides, maybe just 10 minutes. Uh, you know, we'll do a quick introduction and then we'll go to the, the live demo. Uh, setup one, as I said, an objective characterization using the RFLEX system. And uh, we'll spend some time on uh, the wavefront sensor as well. And then we'll stop and do a Q&A on setup one. And then we'll move to setup two, which is uh, a large diameter uh, setup uh, with a 100 millimeter collimated beam. And then we'll just look at uh, a parallel glass. And then uh, we'll have a Q&A as well uh, at the end of setup two, and then some closing remarks. So just to tell you who we are, actually uh, Axiom Optics is actually the US subsidiary of Imagine Optic. Uh, we started in uh, 2010 uh, and we uh, also offer a full um, diversity of, of optical instrumentation. So, you know, not just wavefront sensors, of course, but also, you know, microscope, oops, I'm sorry, uh, microscopy systems, 
a lot of uh, customers here for the for the cameras also for uh, in gas cameras high speed cameras uh, or scientific cameras intensified uh, we also offer beam profiling systems even for high power lasers uh, in optical metrology so we do of course the offlex systems but we also offer a 3d uh, light field camera uh, we offer adaptive optic solutions and also uh, positioning exapods uh, we have people in the West and the East, uh, three people in California, three people here uh, in Boston, and we have lab space here as well. And then of course, you know, the type of customers that we have here, it's kind of a representative, but you know, universities, R&D, labs, you know, large companies, industrial companies who do quality control and so on. Um, I think this is quite representative. And then I'll, I'll leave here uh, Guillaume, to start on this, Guillaume, are you connecting right now? Yes, I am. I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, thanks a lot, Philip, for this kind of introduction. Uh, let me just present in a few words imaging optics. So, our main knowledge uh, is wavefront sensing based on Shakatman technology. Uh, so, we have a very large product range of wavefront sensors. Uh, adapted to many wavelengths, many resolution, many accuracy. Uh, of course, if we are able to measure the wavefront, it's always interesting to correct it. So we have in-house two technologies to uh, manufacture deformable mirrors. Uh, the first one is for high power laser application. Uh, it's based on mechanical actuators and these kind of deformable mirrors are available up to 500 millimeters diameter. And we have also a small one, uh, it's a deformable mirror dedicated for bioimaging, uh, let's say microscopy or ophthalmology. Uh, all these kind of deformable mirrors can have up to 100 actuators, basically. Of course, in order to drive the wavefront sensors and the deformable mirrors, we need, uh, we need software. So we have a software dedicated to metrology, which is our uh, web view and another software WaveTune dedicated to adaptive optics. Uh, we do also systems, engineering, and services. Uh, today, I will present a system. Uh, its name is Offlex 2. Um, it's an optical metrology tool uh, that is dedicated to uh, optics characterization and more precisely transmitted wavefront of these optics. Uh, it's based on a wavefront measurement and a Shackleton wavefront sensor. Uh, what is interesting is this device, it is that it's a self-limited illuminated wavefront sensor, which means that it, it integrates a light source. It is basically made to measure transmitted wavefronts of any kind of convergent optical system. What I mean by convergent optical system means that positive focal length. So it includes uh, camera lenses, lenses, telescopes, microscope objectives, collimators, whatever, of any kind of diameter and F number. Uh, this device is compatible with four different wavefront sensors. As uh, brand bound, the broadband, the first fast and preliminary uh, a high resolution wavefront sensor. And what is interesting in this device is that it's compatible for, um, with a very large range of wavelengths because we can use this device between 400 nanometer to 1100 nanometers. We have also another product which is called Arflex Sphere, dedicated to sphere measurement from 900 to 1600 nanometers. Of course, on this device, we use an uh, in-gas camera uh, and again, a Shackleton sensor based on in-gas camera. This device is, of course, compatible with our uh, WaveView, which is our metro main metrology software, which include PSF and MTF. Uh, let's focus a bit on the sensor we use today on this demo. It uh, has a four broadband. As I said, it's a Shackleton. Uh, here are some specifications. Uh, I want to focus on two of them. The first one is that it is calibrated in the range 350 to 1100 nanometers. 
and the absolute accuracy we ensure is lambda over 100 root mean square. Those two specifications are very important because uh, absolute measurement means that this wavefront sensor is able to measure an incoming wavefront and measures its, its aberration with an ancient accuracy, whatever is the aberration. Uh, for instance, if you want to measure a beam which has one micrometer, one micrometer of coma, uh, the sensor will give you one micrometer of coma in the measurement with the accuracy of lambda over 100 Whitney square. It does not need any calibration or optical pulse uh, dedicated to, uh, to calibrate itself. It is calibrated in-house. Um, uh, if we look now of what I'll show you uh, on the first setup, here it is. Uh, so as you see here, we can see what's inside the R-Flex. So we have a source. In fact, it's not a source because it's uh, we use a source which is a laser diode, which is fibered. And what you see at the top of this drawing is a FC-APC connector dedicated to plug a fiber. So we create a small collimator. It is reflected by a beam splitter and then is uh, focused by a module, what we call a module. Here we use a 31 millimeter focal length module in order to create a diverging beam. And this device, the Orflex 2 plus this module, is set at the focal plane of the lens we want to characterize. Here you see that we have a rod and stock objective with a focal length of 150 millimeters and f number 5.6. Of course, if we want the light to come back to the sensor, we need an autocollimation flat mirror. So the light is sent back to the sensor and the measurement of the aberration possible. On this demo, uh, we'll uh, show, of course, transmitted wavefront measurement of this lens. Then we will see a dichromatism. I have here two sources. The first one is at 658 and the other one at 520. So we'll be able to switch from a wavelength to another to measure the chromatism of this lens. And uh, thanks to the WaveView software, we'll be able to see the point spread function and the modulation transfer function of this objective. And then I'll take the Orflex 2, uh, remove from the first setup and install it on the second setup, which is a large aperture platform. As you see here, the beam now is enlarged by a series of two flat mirrors and a big lens. So now the beam is 100 millimeter diameter. And again, it is reflected by a flat mirror. And if you put, of course, an optical filter, an optical window, whatever, of a large, with a larger diameter, we're able to see the influence of this component on the wavefront and characterize the element. Uh, the common technology that is inside those two systems is a Shackhartman uh, wavefront sensor. So this is basically how it works. Uh, Shackhartman sensor is an association of a detector, let's say a CCD or a CMOS camera, whatever. We, re we remove all the lenses and replace the lens by micro lenses array, which is at about 2.5 millimeters from the, the CCD or CMOS. And if you imagine the flat wavefront coming to this uh, device, uh, the micro lenses array will create an array of spots on the CCD. And if all the spots are on a regular grid, it means that the wavefront is flat because all the spots are exactly at the center of each micro lens. And at the bottom, of course, if the wavefront is not flat, it creates some very low, small angle in front of each micro lens, so the spot is shifted. And by detecting the position of all the spots, we are able to calculate the small angle uh, created by the wavefront aberration. And by knowing the angle of the wavefront, it's in fact, it's derivatives. It's possible by a 2D integration to retrieve the wavefront itself. Uh, so let's switch now, I think, to the video and the demo. Uh, you'll probably see me in a few seconds now. Yes, here am I. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm sitting here uh, just behind the setup I just described. So this is uh, the Orflex here. Um, and uh, we can see 
here as a wireframe sensor. There are two cables starting from this device. The first one is a simple USB cable that goes to the PC. And the second one is a fiber. And this fiber is connected to a laser diode here, which is on the table. You can't see it. As you see here, there is a module here. You see that for the second setup, I have to unscrew it to change to another module. This module here has a focal length of 31 millimeter and it creates a focusing spot that is just here at the focal plane of this lens. And this lens is a rod and stock objective, as I said. And the flat mirror is here. So the beam starts from here. Uh, there is a mirror, a flat mirror here, the lens, the beam splitter, which is here, and the beam is sent here to the flat mirror and come back here to the waveform sensor. Okay. So now let's have a look on the software. I think Patrick will be able to switch to the software. Thank you very much, Patrick. So um, here is the software. I can stop here by pushing this button, the acquisition live and restart it. Uh, I have some few parameters already calculated, but I want to start by showing you the camera signal, which is here and then increase its size in order to see something for you. So here are probably more than 3,000 points created by all the micro lenses. I can just do a zoom here on some few spots to show you how the spots are sampled by the pixels. As you see here, the pixels uh, sample the spot by about 5 or 6 pixels in diameter and it allows us to calculate the centroid very precisely. And as we know the spot position very precisely, it allows us to calculate the wavefront with a very good precision, very good accuracy. So here is the raw signal. Uh, let's hide this to go to the first information we have is the centroid. It can be displayed like this. Um, here it's not very visible, so I can zoom here to show you. Maybe, yes, it is more visible this way. I don't know if it's, yes, okay, so zoom on a quarter of this, of the device. So here the grid corresponds to the micro lenses. And here we have small vectors starting from the center of the micro lens and ending at the actually calculated spot position. So as you see here, as the vectors are not zero, it means that we have some aberration here because the spots are calculated, are calculated not exactly the center of each micro lens. As you see also, if I don't know if it's possible to unzoom and see something. Uh, yes, we can also see that the aberration we're measuring here is quite symmetrical in rotation, uh, as all the vectors are starting from the center and going at the outside of this, uh, this pupil. So these are roughly displayed the wave from derivatives. Uh, we can integrate this by 2D integration to retrieve the wavefront. And here is the wavefront calculated live. As you see, it is updated, uh, I don't know, every one second roughly here in this demo. Uh, so th th this is the wavefront. So one thing which is important on Shark Hartman system is that given the camera signal, we can get the slopes and then calculate the wavefront, it is also possible to retrieve the intensity of the beam. And here you have live, intensity and phase, so amplitude and phase. And phase. So in one single image, we're able to measure the electrical field of light. And this feature is very interesting because for laser application, for instance, it's quite interesting to measure intensity and phase and to know how the laser will focus by just propagating using friend and propagator, for instance. But here we are uh, doing metrology, so the important information we we'll use here is the wavefront. Uh, maybe some of you are experts of uh, wavefront uh, measurement, so maybe some of you may here recognize uh, that this aberration contains mainly let's say spherical aberration, we can see a bit of astigmatism and maybe a small coma here that is visible because this uh, center is not perfectly uh, symmetrical here. Um, one thing that 
I want to show you here is that, as Philip said, we're not in an optical lab here. It's a simply wooden table. Uh, we are in a meeting room. So if I hit the table here, the majority is still feasible. That means that we don't need a very uh, stabilized optical table as interferometry needs. It's not interferometry, definitely. It's Schagerman wavefront measurement, which means that the vibration can be huge. Even with the vibration, it's possible to do the measurement. Um, this is an important thing to know. Uh, let's come back to this wavefront. Uh, a way to analyze more precisely what kind of vibration is, uh, has this uh, wavefront, it's possible to calculate the Anicky coefficient on, that, on this. Uh, let's do this. I will just change the parameter in the software to change to a model calculation. And here I can open the window displaying the Anicky coefficient. Here it is. As you see here, we have all the first, I think, 34 Zernicke coefficients, starting from curvature, which is the blue here. And we have astigmatism here, 0 degree, 45 degrees, the comma x, comma y, the spherical aberration. And then we go to the fifth order and the spherical aberration of the fifth order. As I said, the main aberration, which is is uh, measured here in direct in live on this demo is a spherical aberration. Uh, the amount of aberration here that is calculated by the software is 86 nanometers. I think the magnifier appeared on another screen. Here it is, thank you. So it's 86 nanometer work mean square of aberration. Okay, 80, 87 now, it, because it's live, it changes a little bit. Okay, let's see. Now, I have a way on my demo to change a bit the focus. What, what, we, what can we observe if, if I change just a screw to change the focus? Maybe if you have a look here, I don't know if you see the mouse, but here, as you see, the focus term increase. So I can just adjust live the autocollimation by retrieving the zero focus precisely to get no curvature on my wavefront. This is an example of what can be done because here we have a lens, so I can't change the aberration of this lens. But if you have, for instance, a telescope or a collimator based on two mirrors and you want to align this, uh, this telescope, uh, it's very simple to, for instance, see that the coma can disappear if you align one mirror compared to each other. So you have in direct in live the information of coma that can be decreased by touching one mirror to align perfectly the telescope at the end and then get the final characterization of the telescope after it is aligned. So it's not only a tool for doing characterization. This tool can be used also to align the optical system more generally. Um, so after we have uh, seen this, this aberration here, uh, what we can do is calculate diagnostics. For instance, we can calculate the point spread function. I will, oh no, before that, I want to, to, to show you something which is important. Um, and here, what we see, what we, we see on the, on, the web, on the software is the wavefront of the objective. It's what I want to see. But a question could be, okay, but what about the aberration coming from the device itself? I have mirrors, I have a beam splitter here, I have a lens here. So maybe all this have some aberration. How can I remove this from the measurement? It's quite easy because, in fact, before I, uh, to, in order to prepare this demo, I created a reference here, which is here. That means that the measurement here that is displayed is not the raw measurement coming from the wavefront sensor, but the, the raw measurement minus a previous registered, a previous saved measurement that has been done on a concave spherical mirror. Let me explain this. This, this is a small concave mirror. I don't know if you can see this. It's a very small one. Uh, so if now I have a way to put this mirror at the center of curvature, the center curvature of this mirror, 
exactly at the focal plane of this lens, I am able to save a measurement and then save all the aberrations that are coming from this device. So now, if this concave mirror is a perfect sphere and this flat mirror here that is behind the lens is a perfectly flat mirror, what is displayed here is only the aberration coming from the objective. And this kind of stuff here are liable in, in our accessories, but I'm quite sure, quite sure that all of you have already seen this kind of stuff in your, uh, in your optics lab. Flat mirror and concave mirror. It's very simple. And then the only thing that we have to take care on how we set up the software is that, as I said, the lens is crossed by the light two times. We, the, the beam passes through here and is back. So we measure twice the aberration of this objective. In order to display only the aberration of this lens, we just have to click here double pass. There is an option in our, in our software. Double pass, please divide all the aberration that are measured by two in order to display only the aberration of uh, the objective. So first calibrate the thing using a concave mirror, use a flat mirror, and then divide by two, and you have live the aberration coming from this lens. Okay, let's now try to see what can we do with this, uh, with this uh, aberration. First, I can try to calculate the point spread function. Here it is. The point spread function can be calculated directly from the information of the face. It's just a Fourier transform of the field at the end. So it's possible to calculate here the, the, the point spread function. And I have a slider here. I can change exactly the, the plane where the calculation is done. So I can do a through focus uh, calculation of the point spread function. I can see that the best focus is around here. And for instance, now I have a point spread function. I can calculate the motivation transfer function which is calculated in 2D. And again, I have here a slider allowing me to change the focus in order to check that I'm exactly at the best focus in terms of MTF. As you see, the MTF here is changing depending on the focus I want to, 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 to analyze. Let's go here. What is interesting here is that I can have this information live. If I run the software here, we have this information updated at the frequency of the acquisition of the system, which is here about one hertz. So I can again optimize an optical system, not based on the wavefront, but based on the point fret function if needed, or based even on the MTF. Uh, I didn't that, but you can extract from the 2D MTF the uh, profile you want and even do an average of all the profile in order to get an idea of uh, the MTF, whatever is uh, the orientation of this, uh, this measurement. Um, okay, this is done for that. But now what I can do, as you see here, uh, the wavefront has show a lot of vibration at the edge of the pupil here. So maybe if I remove from this objective a ring corresponding to the very edge of the pupil, I'll be able to optimize the quality of this lens. Let me do that. This objective has an iris, so I can uh, I wrote this in the email, uh, in the slide, but here the lens is uh, the f number of 5.6. Let me just close the iris a little, a little bit. Let's go to 8. And then here I have a focus stem that I can remove it. As you see here, the aberration is now 31, 32 nanometers. So the, this lens is very better in terms of aberration if we just close it a little bit with a half number of eight, 
also uh, having a complete aperture of 5.6. Uh, let me go back to 8 now, to 5.6, sorry. Here it is. So I'm back to the first measurement I did with the fully open iris. So F number 5.6. I just push this now. Okay. And see what happened if I change the wavelengths. Let's again have a look on this focus. I will just try to optimize a little bit the focus in order to put this focus at exactly zero. Okay. This is now perfectly zero. Again, here I'm using a laser diode at 658 nanometers. Uh, I have just here another diode at 520. So let me just stop the acquisition. Here I have a pass through, so I can just remove here the red. and switch to the green. Okay. okay, let's see what happened. But before starting the acquisition, I have to change something in my configuration. As, you, as I said, I calibrate the aberration of my device using the concave spherical mirror. But I did this at 658. Now, I am at 520 in the green. So I need to change the reference and just update the configuration in order to load a, a file that has been saved on the concave mirror in the green. So here is the file. It is here. OK. And then restart the measurement. OK. As you see, maybe, all the aberration here, as you see here, the aberration did not change, which means that roughly by a change of wavelength between 500 and 650, the aberration remains the same, which is expected. But what is not expected at all is the curvature term here, the focus term, Z3. It's minus 0.7 micro, which means that by changing the wavelengths, the curvature suddenly changed a lot. And as I calibrated this with a concave mirror at both wavelengths, I'm sure that the chromatism is linked to the objective, which is here. So here, by doing this experiment, I'm able to perfectly characterize the longitudinal chromatism of this lens. And as you see, it's quite big because if I display the curvature on the wavefront, it is now more than 600. I have to wait a little bit because it does not update, but uh, here, okay, yes, thank you. The, root, the wavefront has now 0.7 nanometer root mean square error, so it's lambda, which is a big aberration. So this lens is quite good for one wavelength, but if you have a white source, a white object to image with this, for sure there will be some chromatism in your image. Well, I think this is it for this first setup. Maybe we can go to the question and answer session. Can you please, Jérôme or Philippe, uh, just have a look on this question. I'd be pleased to answer to it. Sure. So I have a first question. Uh, <clears throat> um, you you modified the, the size of the uh, of the aperture uh, with the with the iris of the uh, of the lens. Some somebody asked uh, about the um, the um, the slopes uh, on the edges of the uh, of the pupil that seem to be uh, larger. Uh, bigger than uh, the the average slopes, um, and uh, this person was wondering what was going on. Okay, so let me redo this. Maybe so I will just change the configuration here in order to uh, have a look on the slopes only. Here are the slopes. 
And if I just try, yeah, okay. Here it is. Uh, you mean that some slopes here at the very edge are a bit higher? Maybe, yes. It's probably due to diffraction because as the iris uh, is not perfectly in the out exit pupil of this uh, lens, it creates small diffraction and the local slope of the wavefront at the very edge of the pupil are uh, changed due to the diffraction of the iris. It's maybe this. It's a good question. But as you see, uh, compared to the slopes we can see in the center of the pupil, at the edge we can see maybe some of them that are a bit higher, but it's not very clear. Yeah, but even before, sorry, this is Philippe, uh, even before you close the iris, you can see a ring of very red uh, vectors. I think that was more the question. Yes, but if I, yes, but these vectors here are linked to the spherical aberration, which is very strong at the edge. Exactly. So yeah. this is real signal. Yeah. Yeah. That was signal. That From was the spherical aberration, which creates very large slopes at the very edge of the, of the pupil. Which, of course, decrease when you close the iris. Um... Sorry. If I close the iris, uh, of course, this is reduced because we have no more measurement on the very edge of this uh, of sense. So the spherical collaboration mainly disappear completely. Mm. Do, do you have uh, typical values for the aberrations brought by the uh, adaptation module that you attach to the Airflex? Um, and how can uh, that uh, optical performance um, affect the, uh, the measurement? Okay, uh, this is again a very interesting question. Of course, uh, as I said, all this stuff here has some aberration. Uh, the modules especially are optimized in order not to have a lot of aberration. And all this has been specified quite uh, uh, tightly. I think depending on the F number of these modules, uh, the aberration at the output of this is between 30 nanometers to 100 nanometers root mean square. Uh, what I can do here maybe is I try, maybe let's, um, let's go this way. I will just open, can you, can you transfer the, just open the file, the reference file just to see the aberration because it's an interesting question. I just opened the measurement I done, let's say at 658 here and see what what's this. And let's see the aberration. Here it is. So this is the measurement done on the concave spherical mirror. So this is quite all this aberration and this module, which is crossed two times. And the uh, aberration here on the whole rectangle is 112 nanometers. So if we extract from this information only the center, it will be of course smaller in the range of 40 or 50 nanometers root mean square. And I'm very confident on saying that this, res this aberration does not affect the measurement of this lens here because it is including the reference and again it is subtracted. Maybe nobody knows, but, but few people knows, but even FISO interferometers uh, have quite a large amount of vibration on the output beam. The vibration we measured on a FISO, on a FISO interferometer had one, more than one lambda vibration because the technique of FISO interferometry does not need a perfect beam because the fringes are created between the reference plane and the, the secondary wave. And that's the same here. Even if we have a small aberration at the output of the offlet, it is subtracted by the reference. Uh, is there a way to 
Can you, could you please, uh, with, so that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, in, the, in the slope diagram, could you, uh, is it possible that you show the spot tracker working and uh, how the, the, um, the tracking algorithm can follow the evolution of a spot even when that spot is going to um, a neighbor, under a neighbor landslide? I can do this by just, okay, sorry. I, I can, yes, it's an interesting point. I can do this here. Let me zoom on a few spots here. Okay, it's a zoom of one single spot. Just to check that I will change the tilt in order to uh, remove, oh, sorry. Uh, in order to, 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 just to check that the tilt I'm doing is small enough. Okay, let's remove this, it's not important. Here, this is, uh, can you please, Patrick, just send me this small, window in my screen. Thank you very much. This is a tilt that is measured by the wavefront sensor and I can change on my experiment uh, by changing the position of the earth legs. I can, or maybe I, no, I do something differently. I have the auto commission flat mirror at, at, here, so I can change a little bit the, the orientation. Let me just add this and change Yes, it is. As you see, the X tilt is changing. As you see, the spot is moving. I can change the tilt. And another spot is coming. And now, this is another spot coming from another micro lens, coming exactly the same place that it was before. And the tilt is measured correctly. This is still minus 36 milli radian. It's because I added a lot of tilt. But the spot tracker, the, the spot tracker, managed to follow the spots during uh, the tilt, and this is why we are able to measure absolute tilt, whatever is the uh, position of the spot uh, on the CCD, even if it comes from the micro lens, which is not in front of the given area on the CCD. C can you please uh, the same movement? Uh, with the, the slopes, showing the slopes and the spot on the, on the viewer, please. Here, this, in live? Yeah. yeah. Okay, but the problem is that if I want to display the tilt, the vectors now are, are huge. Yeah. Because the tilt is very strong compared to the aberration. So let me, okay, let me just display the X tilt and reduce the vector length in order to see something and redo the zoom in order to get only a quarter of the of the wavefront sensor let's see what happened now oh sorry here it is and redo the same with my screw here i can change the position the orientation of the autocollimation flat that goes the other way as you see the the vectors are increasing and now it's a superimpose, so it's not very visible, but I can go the other way. As you see here, I have no tilt, and then I can go and see the, I have to unzoom here, in order to follow and to see the vector's length. Oops, sorry for that, it's a bit too strong now, here. And I can continue, go to up to 66 milli radian, as you see, the vectors are still increasing in length, and I can go even further. And see a 60 milli radian, I have still another spot coming, and the measure tilt is still okay. We still, we found the spots during the acquisition. Okay? There is also a question, but I think we should uh, uh, maybe like uh, go ahead with the second part of the demo in order to to maintain the to contain everything in one hour. I don't know what you what you guys think. Okay, I'm okay. 
Let's switch to the other demo. Okay, let's switch to the other demo now. Yes, you're right, Jerome. Thank you. When you switch, please answer one question. Um, what about the you 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 were explaining how um, little impact the wavefront error of the of the adaptation module could have on the measurement, but um, somebody is asking about the temperature and uh, how temperature could uh, could affect uh, some uh, temperature variation could uh, could affect the aberration introduced by the module, and so uh, um, have some uh, discrepancy in the reference. Yes, of course, as uh, all optics in temperature affect uh, the aberrations and probably the focus term, firstly. Uh, our advice, of course, is to, uh, to have always in hand this kind of concave mirror I described in order to reduce calibration from time to time. Optics lab are usually stabilized at the level of plus or minus one degree C. And we know that with this level of, ta of temperature stabilization, no need of reference uh, is uh, uh, the, the new reference, the, a reference acquired at 20 is still uh, okay for 21 degrees C. But of course, if we want to be very sure that everything is okay, whatever is the temperature, you can redo each time this small reference measurement to be sure that uh, the temperature does not affect the measurement you're doing. But that's the same for all technology in our uh, wavefront sensing. Okay, let's switch to the second setup now. I think it's time. So what I'll do, maybe Patrick can show you very quickly the large aperture platform, which is just an eerie here. So what I'll do is just take this off flex here and unscrew one single screw I have here at the bottom in order to take it and put it on the large aperture platform. So to question a few seconds. Okay, the screw is now removed. <coughs> Okay, it's, good. it's an opportunity for me to just to show you very, maybe more precisely the system. So we can very now we can we can see now the wavefront sensor here, the fiber. So it's a FC APC uh, connector to plug the fiber and the module in front of the center of the R flex, which is here. So as I said in introduction, this large aperture platform has been designed in order to be used with another module. So I will just show you how I change the module. So I will just unscrew the F31 module and change it to the F50 module, F, uh, 60, it's a 60 millimeter uh, focal length module. So just remove this, unscrew the new one. And uh, we have quite a smart mechanical engineers here in Imagine Optics. So they design a very nice, interface to set the R-Flex on the large aperture platform. We have two very big magnets here, and this is this piece here is made of steel. So, and there is three points and three balls here. So I can just put the sensor, the, the, the R-Flex, onto the platform very precisely in order just to put all this exactly at the correct position here and here. Yeah, it is correct now. As you see, this system allows you to replace the R-Flex exactly at the same position. Okay. As you see also, it's a question of minutes. I just changed the setup. I was measuring uh, uh, converging lenses, and now I'm ready to do measurement on flat glass. At a zero pole, let's say zero pole uh, transmitted glass. So, uh, maybe you remember the slide describing this. So we have now the R-Flex, always here a focusing spot. And we have two mirrors here, one is here, one is here. And we have big lens here. 
So the beam now uh, at the output is collimated with a diameter of more than 100 millimeter, and it is reflected by another flat mirror and set back in the system to be measured by the wavefront sensor, which is here. Okay, as I change the module, as I change the configuration, I have to uh, do some adjustment in the software. And of course, this reference here I used for the previous setup is not good uh, anymore. So I will just remove the reference. Now, now I will display the, uh, the row, the absolute wavefront required by this sensor here. So let's see what here it is. This is the absolute wavefront measured in line. Uh, here. What's interesting here is that, as you see, we have a small tilt here, minus 10 milli radian, which means that the flat mirror is not perfectly in autocollimation, so I can just change a bit the orientation of this mirror to retrieve the autocollimation. For those of you who already use a FISO deferometer, it's the same. You reduce the number of fringes by changing the tilt. This is exactly the same. Uh, you can retrieve the autocollimation very precisely here by looking at the measured tilt on the wavefront sensor. So here is the aberration. Now, what I want to show you here, we deal with quite a long optical path, so it's maybe two meters, large diameter. So the air turbulence becomes a limitation of the measurement. And this is an important thing to discuss is that we can very easily uh, remove the influence of air by averaging. So what I'll do now is change a little bit the configuration of the software in order to average the measurements. So here, as you see, the measurement is not average. Can you please type zero, uh, Patrick, please? Thank you. By putting 10 here, it means that now the system will acquire 10 images. And after 10 images are acquired, the wavefront calculation is done on the image. And this stabilizes a lot the measurement. What I can do also is use the auto reference mode. It's a very interesting mode because automatically, when I click here, the system will save a reference and display all the other measurements done subtracted from this first reference automatically acquired. When I click here, Oh, this measurement is done, and now this is the difference. And as you see, here, maybe Patrick, you can send me this magnifier on the main screen, please, thank you. This is the root mean square wavefront error of sensitivity we have here in this environment, which is quite a poor environment. Again, we are on modern table here. So this device allows having nanometer sensitivity measurement on the wavefront without any very complex optical table stabilizing vibration. It's possible to do this on both of the table. It's important. I can show you something here. Now, I just create heat on my hand and put my hand here at the bottom of the beam, which has 100 millimeter diameter. As you see now, as the heat change uh, a bit the reflection index of air, we are able to see the influence of air turbulences in the room very easily. At the nanometer level of metrology, it's very easy to see the influence of air. Um, I will just, in order to have a faster refresh rate, can you just type one, please? Thank you. Yes, it's a bit uh, quicker now, uh, refresh um, frame rate. Um, now, let's see what happens if I put my finger in the beam. Okay, as you see, without any configuration, let's say something like mask or thing like this, the software automatically, automatically detects that there is no spot here in the camera signal, and as there is no spot, the wavefront can't be calculated. But everywhere else, wavefront is calculated. And what we can see is a bit the, the heat of my finger here, as you see, we can even see the air turbulences created by my, my finger. Okay. 
we have live measurement here. I can do even uh, something even more uh, impressive. Just it's, it's a bomb of dry air. What's interesting is this dry air. It's, it's, it's cold. So what happens if I put this in the beam? Uh, here is the tube, and I can pop. Just try to. Let's see this. Try to send the as a refresh rate is not very nice. Yeah. Okay. Ah, yes, we can see some. The problem is that I have to. Yeah, we can see some very quite interesting thing here. Okay, so it's a way, but of course, this is a demo, so this is not very interesting. Just to show you how sensitive is this device. Uh, I have here three different kinds of samples. Uh, the first one is a piece of a uh, windshield. Uh, it's quite a specific one, but it's, uh, it's a windshield. So what happened here if I put this windshield between the system and the flat mirror? So here you can see the effect of this windshield. Uh, the aberration is now more than one micron within square, so it's very easy. Here I just move a bit the, the windshield in order to see another part of this device. And it's very easy now to characterize it, see if the wavefront that is uh, acquired is okay comparing to the specification of this glass uh, and analyze things. Uh, don't forget that by knowing the wavefront, it's very easy to calculate the local curvature of the wavefront and calculate the diopters, which is closer to the, all the rules and normalization of all this kind of device, windshield and, uh, and I um, glass. Okay. Uh, here is another sample. You should recognize that. I can also try to, to see what happened. As you see, you can see things here uh, in transmitted wavefront. So again, it's possible to analyze uh, plastic things in order to see where are the, the injection point, for instance, if uh, the, the specification of this kind of device are reached. And last sample uh, is a piece of glass. It's a, a floaty glass, so it's very interesting to see because, as you see, it has a very particular structure. Only one direction. Here is vertical thing. If I rotate now the, the sample by 90 degrees, you see now, of course, this is vertical. So this is coming from the fact that this lens, this glass is floated, so it's basically made by a uh, very hot glass, which is uh, spread. spread on a uh, tin, uh, and this creates this uh, wave here. So. Uh, it's very important for this guy to know what kind of sickness, uh, inhomogeneity uh, are uh, in this kind of lens, uh, in this kind of uh, glass, to check that uh, this glass can be used for other purposes than just a window. Um, as you've seen, we did many measurements here. We still hear 3 nanometers in square wave from Terra. And we can do many kinds of things by doing this. I want to conclude this demo by showing you something interesting now, again. Uh, and it will be my last, uh, my last thing. As you probably saw, already saw here in this device, there is a sharp and wavefront sensor. And I can very quickly remove only the wavefront sensor from the RFLEX2 and use this wavefront sensor as a wavefront sensor, for instance, to measure laser, uh, to measure something else. And if I want to re-put this sensor on here, the bench, thanks to this very smart mechanical interface, I just re-put this and retrieve the same measurement that I had, 3 nanometers root mean square. So here we started from a converging optics to flat with no power glass 
and we end it by the possibility of removing the sensor in order to do uh, all the measurements. So it shows how um, what the huge number of applications of this kind of device. Philip, don't you want to Great. Great. conclude uh, my business? With right. So what we'll do right now, I just have one more slide at conclusion, and then there, there are there are quite a few questions, and uh, and uh, we can do that, uh, you know, in the next minute, basically. All right. So let me see. Let me share my screen now. And so just to uh, just to summarize this and then we'll do a final Q&A. Huh? So please uh, stay put. Um, we've, we've showed measurements uh, in this webinar on, on flat and converging optics. We actually showed uh, that we could align, uh, do some alignment with the system because we can get a few measurements per second. And we can see, you know, the influence of uh, lens positions and, you know, on the coma, for example, on spherical aberrations and, and so on. Uh, and we can do some characterization. So, you know, meaning like, you know, measuring MTF, measuring wavefront, uh, measuring the Zernike polynomials, measuring the, the point spread function. And also we show the measurement of uh, chromatic aberration. Uh, we showed quite a nice accuracy, I think, especially in these conditions. Uh, the accuracy of the system is uh, lambda over 300, uh, the repeatability of the system. And also, uh, you know, despite the environment, we showed that, uh, you know, even with some vibrations or on a table, which is not an optics table, we could, we could get these kinds of uh, accuracy. Now, I think that I hope everyone appreciates the modularity of the system, uh, the fact that it's multi-wavelength, and ease and the ease of use, meaning that we can take out things, we can take out the R flex from the from the large aperture collimator, we can take out the wavefront sensor from the R flex, position them again, and we get uh, consistent results. We can change the the optical fiber and do the same thing with the, with a different wavelength. Uh, referencing was shown when we were. Uh, making a reference on the flat mirror, for example, we didn't show it on the spherical mirror because it means that we had to, you know, attach it and, you know, maybe align it and so on. And also, uh, you know, the insensitivity of the system and how it, how it behaves with masking. Uh, so when Guillaume was putting his finger in the screen, he didn't just disturb the whole, um, the whole measurement. Uh, you just, just keep getting measurements where the finger is not there. And that's, you know, some other systems don't have that kind of, of behavior. Um, and then again, we showed some relatively simple examples today, you know, a flat piece of glass and, you know, a camera lens. But uh, this applies to other things that, are, that could be much more complicated with many more lenses and many more uh, interfaces, you know, uh, or things that are bigger, like telescopes. Uh, you know, a biomedical instrument, for example, a whole microscope can be characterized this way as well, or, you know, any kind of bench, bench top optical setups that you have. Um, and to, to finish here, um, Jérôme, you can, you know, these are the equipment and, and the specifications that kind of summarize uh, the system here. Uh, there's two RFLEX, one for 400 to 1100, actually it's 350 to 1100 nanometers. Um, different resolutions can be chosen because you can use different sensors, uh, different focusing modules, so you can adapt the numerical aperture uh, and uh, different collimators from 25 to 150, maybe 200 millimeter. We can do things on request, of course, different light sources. And we also have a, a system for the, uh, for the shortwave infrared uh, region, um, using an in-gas camera for the for the wavefront sensor, we can work on the 900 to 1700 uh, nanometer as well. And um, and I think it's time for a final Q and A. Uh, Jerome, do you want to go over that and select some some? I think there are quite a few questions there. Hello? 
yeah, most of the questions have been treated, processed uh, through the uh, through the app. I'm thinking of like maybe sharing a few of them. Um, can you measure a, a convex mirror with this system? Yeah, yes. Uh, yes, it's possible to measure convex mirror, but uh, the idea is to completely shape the light that is at the output of the R-Flex 2. For example, you can enlarge the beam and then focus the beam to the F number needed to characterize the concave mirror in autocollimation by focusing the light in the center of curvature of the concave mirror. We don't have uh, standard modules that is um, dedicated to this application, but if you uh, want, we can try to design a specific one in order to create a converging beam, in order to be able to set the concave mirror in the center of curvature, in order to retrieve your collimation thanks to this mirror. Hi everyone, um, we're we want to uh, start a poll of four questions and if you can answer them, that would be great. So uh, our first uh, poll is starting now. And during this time, uh, Jerome or Philip will also be um, looking at the question and answers and willing to provide answers for your questions. There's a question regarding the, the scaling of what's being displayed. Um, I'm not sure to entirely understand the, the question, but maybe uh, you will, Guillaume. So let me read it. Uh, with the LA100, can you scale your wavefront to the size of the object? It appears to be the camera scale at the moment. Yes, um, yes, uh, this is an interesting question. Uh, no, the software does not allow to do that. Um, the, you're, you're right. The display here we see on the web view uh, still remain on the wavefront sensor side, which means that we do not take into account the magnification created by the AFOCOL system, consists by the modules and the large lens. Uh, we, we discuss a lot about this, why we specify the software. In our point of view, it's a best way to allow our customer to do huge error uh, while interpreting the measurement. Because if you change, if you allow the customer to change the magnification, you'll be able to interpret the data that is displayed completely wrongly. So it's a choice that we did uh, the only answer I can do with is that extract from the wavefront sensor from the software the data file and uh, do the magnification yourself using your your preferred tool uh, Excel or Python or I don't know. Where. Okay, I think we're about to conclude this. Let's, uh, I mean, offline, uh, you, you can definitely contact us, uh, Jerome or, or, or myself. Uh, don't hesitate to do that and we'll relay the questions. We can connect uh, Guillaume uh, with the people, no problem. And uh, we can go from there. I hope everyone uh, appreciated that uh, the event. And uh, again, we have two more webinars coming and we'll uh, we'll send invitations to to everyone. Thank you, and uh, and have a nice day. Thank you. <clears throat> Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.